families and those who are still being searched for tonight. That is the story for this week. Tucker Carlson is up next. Well, good evening and welcome to Tucker Carlson tonight. Washington, D.C. is a divided city, but today saw a moment of rare political unity. Lawmakers in both parties came together in grave agreement that it was unfortunate, unacceptable, indeed threatening, that President Trump would refer to poor and dangerous countries as, in effect, poor and dangerous. Now, some of the outrage was tactical, obviously, a way to score a political advantage. But a great deal of it was entirely real. It was authentic rage. So why are the people in charge hysterical about this? Is it because Trump said something racially insensitive? Let's see. Just yesterday, Nancy Pelosi dismissed the DACA negotiation because there were too many white people involved, and most people here didn't even notice. So left-wing attacks on the basis of race are now common, very common. So could it be they found it shocking the president would criticize an entire nation? Maybe. But then the left has no problem bashing huge parts of this country. You could put half of Trump supporters into what I call the basket of deplorables. <laughs> right? The racist, sexist, homophobic, xenophobic, Islamophobic. They get better and they claim to guns or religion or... Uh, antipathy toward people who aren't like that. The five white guys, I call them, you know. Um, <laughs> I said, are you going to open a hamburger stand next or what? So they don't have a problem dismissing entire populations. So what is the real reason for the panic you're watching right now on cable television? Maybe it's because Trump's remarks are forcing precisely the kind of conversation our leaders don't want to have. He didn't do it on purpose, it was accidental, but he still raised questions they'd rather not answer, like, who exactly are we importing into our country, and how are they doing once they get here? Answer, of course, well, they're all valedictorians and war heroes, and in fact, way more impressive and way more American than you will ever be, so shut up. That's what we're told, that's what we're required to believe. What if it's not true? Last year, the U.S. accepted 23,000 people from Haiti and 172,000 from Mexico. Immigration from El Salvador has been so brisk in recent years that one in three Salvadorans now lives in the United States. Has America become a better country as a result? Maybe. Maybe not. Maybe we ought to talk it through and decide before we continue with our current immigration policy. Leaders who actually cared about their people would do exactly that. And yet our leaders just yell at us until we stop asking questions. Senator Lindsey Graham of South Carolina released a statement today that neatly summarizes how most of official Washington thinks about this subject. In a statement, Graham dismisses the idea that America should even think about what kind of people it lets in. Quote, I've always believed that America is an idea, Graham wrote, not defined by its people, but by its ideals. Diversity has always been our strength, not our weakness. America is defined by its ideals. Okay, so what are those ideals? It might be useful to know, considering how important they are. Well, diversity is our strength is the only one our leaders seem to agree on. The less we have in common, somehow, the stronger we are. Is that true? We'd better hope it's true, because we're betting everything on it. But there's a deeper problem with what Senator Graham said. Quote, America is not defined by its people. Really? What do its people think about that? Are they pleased to learn their leaders consider them merely a commodity, a set of interchangeable parts? America's actual people, with their actual families and towns and traditions and history and customs, may be surprised to learn that they're irrelevant to the success or failure of what they imagined was their country. According to Lindsey Graham, you could take our entire population and swap it out for 320 million, I don't know, Chinese or Indians or Africans or Canadians or people from New Zealand. And the place would be no different, so long as the idea was still there. Does anyone actually believe that? How about we test that idea, starting with the U.S. Senate? Would South Carolina get the same representation from someone randomly selected out of the phone book? As Lindsey Graham would say, the Senate isn't defined by its people. It's really just an idea. And as soon as you start defining things by ideas rather than individuals, people become irrelevant. 
Jason Nichols is a professor of African American Studies at the University of Maryland, and he joins us tonight. Professor, thanks for coming up. Thank you. So this isn't a debate, from my perspective, over whether or not the president is vulgar. Yeah, he is. It's a much bigger debate about people and do they matter? Are people interchangeable? Are all populations the same? So if I took your neighborhood where you live and took out everyone who lived there and replaced them with other people from somewhere else, would the neighborhood be the same? So first thing, since you said it's about people, I do want to mention a couple of people. Uh, I'd like to mention U.S. Army Sergeant Mario Nelson, who gave his life for this country. Mario Nelson was born in Haiti. Yeah. He left a three-year-old daughter who's now a teenager. If she's watching this show, I want to give my condolences. But he gave his life for this country. My friend Paul, who uh, but his, his very good friend, while he was in Afghanistan, died in a rocket attack. She was born in Kenya. But if you're, if you're so, expecting me to be surprised, I'm not at all. I, I spent part of the day with a terrific guy from Haiti. I mean, there are a lot of excellent. great immigrants here, including from Haiti and El Salvador and a lot of countries you wouldn't want to live in, and they're great people. Mm -hmm. I'm not contesting that at all. Okay. So, I'm merely saying the idea that all populations are the same or the people of America don't have a right to determine who comes here, or if you take a ton of people and replace them with another group of people, that it's, everything's exactly the same if they have the same idea. That's just not true. Well, then, if we, if we believe that we like the way America is right now, then why are we trying to get rid of large numbers of people who are here? Well, there, I don't know, but I, but, right but I guess, now. but that's, and, and again, I'll but, mention the way, one I other appreciate, name. Friend, but look, I, I could, we could play the, I know okay. an impressive immigrant game, so, and I would agree with you in every case, because there are a lot of impressive immigrants, okay. but there are also a lot of impressive native born Americans and unimpressive Absolutely, ones who need our help. Two of us right here. Who need our help. There are a lot of them. Sure. But the idea that it's somehow outrageous or bigoted to say that there are differences between countries or cultures. That's insane. That's lying. So what is, what is outrageous and bigoted among many things that our president has said? What is outrageous and bigoted is to select certain places and call them crap holes. And, I, and again, I'm going to edit myself here, but to call them crap holes. Now, again, Haiti and continental Africa have very little in common other than the, the color of the skin of the residents who live there. The other thing that I would say is this. He talks about we want people from Nigeria, but we don't want people, or we, excuse me, we want people from Norway, but not from Nigeria. Now, again, Nigeria has a higher GDP than Norway does. It is the wealthiest country in Africa. So he's saying he wants well, a American. I mean, but, I mean, look, it's it's hardly relevant to the point. But is Norway, it? I, well, no, but I, you're wrong on that it's, one point. Norway, I think, is the richest country in the world. No, actually, the GDP, the way I saw it, was uh, I think it's 300. Okay, well, look, I mean, seventy here's, billion. Here's the point: we get a ton more people from Nigeria than we do from Norway if by uh, sure. and I think because a lot people of, from Norway don't have to leave okay there's but, no reason to leave but, Nor but Norway you get free health care up until the age of 16 if if you were really interested in helping America mm -hmm. you would want the most impressive people you could find some would be from Nigeria some would be from Norway some would be from Togo some would be from Japan to move here but you would rate them on the basis of how impressive they were you would not say the first people to get here are people who have relatives here. You don't run your college that way. Harvard doesn't let in the first 7,000 Salvadorans who apply. They say, no, 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 we're taking the best only. Why don't we do that? I think we do do that. As a we matter of fact, one that. of the things that you said about Nigeria, the last time we were here, is that they have a higher median income and are more educated than native-born Americans when they get here, Nigerian immigrants. So, no, they're not going back to their huts, as the president said. Okay, there are people you're who kind come of missing here, the point work because really hard, actually, and do really well. You, if you are claiming that we are bringing the most impressive people here, then you don't know much about our system which gives overwhelming priority to people who have relatives here. Being related to someone is not a qualification. It's an accident. So we don't have that. That's not a criterion that Apple uses when it hires people. If you really cared about America, you would say, we're only taking the best. We'll devise a test to figure out who they are, but we're only taking those people. Well, again, I, we I think, I think uh, Sergeant Nelson was the best. He came here. He sacrificed his life for this country. I, I, but I agree. I'm not, then, I'm not contesting that. So then, so then what? I, I'm not Oh, so you're saying, your oh, my argument we, we is have, we have that if you care... We have people come here who work extremely hard do. and do, and some of them do very well. We do, of course, and we also you know, have people who come here and don't do well. But the point yeah, is not them. And they're native-born people the same way. The point is not them. This country belongs to American citizens, period. Okay, so that's, that's where we start. But second, 
if you ran your college like we run our country, or Harvard ran its college like we run our country, or any company did, it would go out of business. And it would suggest that people who ran that company or college didn't really care about the enterprise they were in charge of because they weren't trying to find just the best. Why don't we do that? I don't understand. Again, I think that our immigration system certainly needs work. It needs some changes. However, the, the president has made this about race and ethnicity. And that's the problem here. Really? I don't, I don't, I kind of miss that so part. You're missing so the that president part? said we should have a merit based system. That's not what the president people... said. The president said certain, we don't want people from certain crap holes. You know, and was referring to the African continent. No, he was saying he that was referring... our, our immigrant. Look, I'm not here Again, to defend. You, you, I'm here. You are correcting I'm, his statement. I'm not. I'm here not here to correct what he said. Yeah. I'm here to make the case for acting on behalf of our country with a merit-based so, immigration Tucker, system. So, Tucker Carlson, if you were president garbage. of the United States and you said those things, we could sit here and have a discussion about that. I'd be 100 percent open to that. Oh, would you what, really? You'd be, you'd be open problem, to it. I don't the think so. The problem is. The problem is. You are sitting here and making an argument that the president hasn't made. That's fine. I don't, then, look, I, I think as a general matter, we pay way too much attention to the brain droppings of the president. I'm making a he's case. He's the president. He's he the president. Pay but there are a lot of other says. people. They in have the, real consequences. The White House has issued its plans, which have been rejected out of hand by Democrats, which would end chain migration, make this a merit-based system, end the diversity lottery, and install E-Verify universally so we're not giving jobs so to let, illegals. So let's talk about some What's of the other things. What's wrong with those ideas? Let's talk about some of the other things that, that uh, this administration but Do you, do you agree with doing. those ideas? The administration right now has taken it... Uh, has increased the, uh, the amount of people that they're trying to deport and has, is talking about leaving 800,000 young people who have lived here, like my friend Na Nancy Raisi, since the, the age of okay, three, why, trying to keep well, them So we're not allowed to deport people who are here illegally? If I show up at Harvard without enrolling and start taking classes and they kick me off campus, are they immoral for doing that? Like, what are you if, talking about? If someone about? has been here since the age of three and didn't choose to be here, and they, this is all that they know. Yes, that is immoral. Any non-criminal yes, DACA is, recipients, and that, we're not going to, a, as you know. But there, people who commit crimes who are here illegally, why do they have a right to be here? I'm totally. But it's not that. about crime. As a matter of fact, since the Obama administration, the people who are being detained, <laughs> who have not committed crimes, <laughs> you haven't crimes, answered any of my questions. Have, have risen. Uh, okay. I just want to treat our country with the love and respect that you treat your college with. That's it. Absolutely, and I and I want. A country that sticks to its values. Right. One of the things that is Which on. Is protecting its own people one, over one, and against One of the things that is countries. on one of the greatest symbols of freedom in this country, of course, is the poem that talks about the huddled masses. It talks about bringing poor, even homeless people, and yeah, giving them done, opportunities. Yeah, we've done a lot of. We've done a lot of that. And but that is something that we stand for. As yeah. A what we stand for is protecting our own people because it's their country. It doesn't belong to people from other countries. It belongs to us. We're Americans. That's the whole point of a government. And I don't think our interests are being looked out for first. I just don't. Yeah, I, I would disagree with that. All right. I think. Well, no, I agree with you that I think this administration is not always looking out for all its citizens. <laughs> okay. I right. certainly Thank agree you. with you. Good to see you. Absolutely. Victor Davis Hanson, a fellow at the Hoover Institution and professor at Cal State Fullerton. And he joins us tonight. Professor, thank you for coming on. What do you make of this debate? Well, I mean, everybody believes that the president would be better off using language from the Sermon on the Mount than Howard Stern. And he could have easily said, we would like to prefer people come from the top tier in the new UN Development Report or GDP rather than the bottom tier. And after the I mean, after the uh, Michael Wolff uh, book, Mythography, and the surveilling, he should be very careful of what he says to anybody, much less to Dick Durbin. But all of that said, there's really a divide in the country, and about half the country believes in the melting pot, and that we want to assimilate, we want to intermarry, we want to integrate people so that their outward appearance, their ethnic identification, their race, if you will, is incidental. It's not essential to who they are as individuals. And to do that, we need diverse immigration. We have 30% of all people come from one country, Mexico. We need meritocratic, we need legal immigration, and to the degree somebody has skill sets or capital or knows English, that facilitates the melting pot. But the other half, and Jennifer Palmieri, the former Clinton communications director, said that the purpose of DACA was to get future Democratic votes. And they don't believe that. They have sort of a tribal view identity politics collectives and to further that vision they want as many people as they can to come and not to integrate not to assimilate rapidly and to be predictable in the way that they vote 
and that their outward appearance is essential, not incidental to their character. And that's, that's the issue, whether the salad bowl or the uh, melting pot. In the case of the progressive movement, they saw what the American Southwest has become. It went from red to purple, maybe to blue, and it's got enormous implications for the Electoral College. But remember what the message is. Come here and be dependent on a, a government and look to your identity in collective terms and vote in a quid pro quo fashion for those who are your ethnic tribune. So it's pretty cynical. And uh, I guess I get the, well, I would, we're all I getting would tired. I just stop you and say it's more than cynical. I, I mean, if that's true, it's criminal. Importing people solely for the purpose of bolstering your own power, hoping to get obedient voters rather than citizens, I mean, that's a, that's a crime. But, I mean, if you really cared about immigrants, you would say we want people to come after we have prepped them in a country or they've been prepped to know English and they came legally and they came in a diverse fashion from all over the world because we know historically that when people come in diverse uh, groups and they're not in single enclaves, that they assimilate more and they integrate more. We don't, if your name is Giuliani or Cuomo, we can't tell how you vote now. It's incidental being Italian American. That's what we want for Lopez and so. Mendoza. That's not what the progressive movement wants. They You're see right. as a, an, an avenue to electro, electoral success through immigration, often illegal. And it's pretty cynical when you have all these virtues signaling very wealthy people like Jeff Bezos or Mark Zuckerberg who don't. Their rhetoric doesn't match their lives. They live in compounds. They put their kids in private schools. I'm in southwest Fresno County. All my kids went to public schools. I, I, I live every day with Mexican-Americans and people here illegally. There's a lot of problems when you have so many people coming so quickly from one place without English right. capital or education. But rather than deny, you can't deny that. And we have to work on the melting pot. But if you want to encourage that separatism, for political purposes, then you're the one that's culpable. You're the one that's amoral. Exactly. You're the one that's unethical. There's never been a country with a worse ruling class than the one we have now. It's really striking. Professor, never been thank a, you. A nicer, yeah, thank you. Members of the press were in tears, some of them literally, over the president's comments yesterday. So who outdid him or herself on the tube last night? If you didn't see it, it was pretty unbelievable. We've got the highlights next. American media are in a perpetual state of crisis over the words and behavior of the president, but even accounting for that, their reaction to his remarks about Haiti and other undesirable countries was over the top. The president of the United States is racist. Sir, they're not whole countries. For one, Donald Trump isn't their president. Because we now know that we have in the White House someone who could lead the Ku Klux Klan in the United States of America, somebody who could be the leader of the neo-Nazi. Our president is a clear and present danger to non-white people in America. <laughs> Gutierrez got unbelievable. Joe Concha writes about media for the Hill, watches TV for a living and joins us tonight. So Joe, I was preparing for yesterday's show, so I missed a lot of this. What were our moral leaders our ethical betters on cable television telling us last night. Our media overlords, well, for starters, I'm a little banged up today, I, I got to admit, because I was stupid enough to play the S-hole drinking game, which is entailed by if someone says S-hole, uncensored, right, the, the, the whole thing, yeah. you have to do a Boilermaker shot. And oh. by the end of the night... You're in the hospital? Yeah, it was said 36 times. So I actually did 36 Boilermaker shots, which meant I got to see the afterlife, which is glorious, until the EMT <laughs> bought me back. Uh, but that was the thing, right? It was an attention prop that if you're going to use S-hole in a report, quote it once, it's verbatim, I get it, do it. After that, it, it becomes simply a matter of, hey, look at me, I'm being edgy, I'm swearing on the air. And, and on one network alone, it was said 36 times for effect. It's interesting. I mean, look, I can understand why people, you know, are offended by profanity or offended by what the president said. Was there any conversation, though, about what it meant and about the implications for the country and the debate that underlies it about who should come here and who makes the country better and who doesn't? Was there any conversation about that at all that you saw? No, it, it was primarily a matter of am I morally more morally virtuous than you. Yeah. That's what debates come, come down to now. It wasn't like, okay, 
uh, is this an economic argument that the president is making? Is he sticking up for the American worker, or was it a racist statement? And you had one argument uh, over on CNN, and it was uh, between Rick Wilson, who's a GOP strategist, like a never Trumper, and then John Fredericks, who uh, hosts a radio show in, in Washington, conservative, right? Uh -huh. And this is what Wilson said, and I'm quoting here. He said, after they go back and forth, and Fredericks is trying to say, look, we got to bring better people into the country, mainly making your argument, right? Yeah. Uh, and Wilson's just yelling at him, saying, no, 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 you're a racist, and why don't you just go to the Home Depot and put a white hood on your head? He then says this. He says, I would like to gut you like a fish on this show. Gut you like a fish. And that's what? what passes now for debate in this country. It's we got to insult. And, and guess what? He got big headlines, Rick Wilson, for saying that. So in other words, you're a bad person. I'm yeah. a good person. But the, I mean, what? So is that the whole point? Was there no attempt to kind of explain what this might be about or the implications for viewers? Or was it, or was it all just this moral preening by maybe the single least impressive group of people in the entire country, cable news people? Is that all it was? <laughs> Which includes us. Uh, yeah. yeah, look, it, it was it was a panel that was kind of hard to follow because everybody's yelling at each other. Uh, Don Lemon, give him credit, he stepped in and said, yeah, look, that, that, that's enough after the gutting thing. But uh, it, it's just very hard to follow. And really, it was a matter of just people yelling past each other. No one wants to exchange any ideas anymore. People just want to bring attention to themselves by being the loudest voice in the room. Boy, it's so unimpressive. <laughs> Joe, Joe, thank you. No, thank, thank you. you for that I'll... depressing update and for doing the work that we don't want to do and watching that stuff. Thanks Rehydrate, Hub Tucker. That's, that's the whole trick right now. Rehydrate. <laughs> Newly released testimony from the founder of Fusion GPS indicates that company tried to derail the FBI's Clinton investigation. Truly, the author of Clinton Cash is here with details next. Stay tuned. Fusion GPS founder Glenn Simpson gave secret testimony to Congress a while ago. It was released this week by Dianne Feinstein. The transcript seems to have unwelcome and probably unintended revelations for Democrats, though. For instance, Simpson's testimony suggests that even as Fusion was encouraging an FBI investigation of Trump and his campaign, it was also trying to hinder an investigation into the Clinton Foundation. Huh? Peter Schweitzer is very familiar with subjects like these. He wrote Clinton Cash. He's an expert on all the arms of the vast Clinton nonprofit and profitable octopus. He joins us tonight. So, Peter, tell us what this transcript suggests. Well, what it suggests is that Glenn Simpson did not like the fact that the FBI in uh, August and then later October was looking to reopen the Clinton email investigation. And in fact, he testified that when he heard that the FBI was considering this, that he contacted the FBI, he encouraged other journalists to contact the FBI and his partner Christopher Steele, the ex-British uh, intelligence officer, stopped cooperating with the FBI on the Trump dossier. This is all according to Glenn Simpson himself. So it raises questions, you know, about who this guy actually is. He's not the sort of disinterested fact finder who was sort of shocked and appalled by what they found uh, regarding Trump, uh, that he was actually doing the bidding of his client, which, as we now know, happened to be the Hillary Clinton campaign. But the, bro but the broader bidding, not just, I mean, so my understanding was here's a former newspaper reporter hired to dig up information on her opponent. That's pretty conventional. That happens a lot during campaigns. Right. But this suggests that he was, in fact, a partisan trying to help the Clintons in another arena entirely? Yeah, that's exactly right. And look, I mean, you know, he continues to use the term, Simpson, that this is sort of opposition research. You know, uh, Tucker, you and I have been around the block in Washington for a while. Um, that dossier was not opposition research. Opposition research is only useful if you can gather information and then give it to the media and the media can replicate it. The Trump dossier was Good all point. anonymous sources, you know, based on, on two to three iterations. Um, it was shared with uh, newspaper reporters, but more specifically was shared with the FBI. And the whole process shows how terrible the sausage making was in this case. I mean, Fusion GPS is, is uh, trying to intervene in a possible Clinton Foundation investigation, uh, sorry, Clinton email investigation. They're pushing this product that, that uh, you know, Simpson admits in his testimony he never verified he never attempted to verify huh. it just really shows that what his job was was to try to wreak havoc on the Trump campaign and help Hillary Clinton by initiating a federal criminal investigation into the Trump campaign not by digging up usable oppo 
Yeah, that's exactly right. And so what they did is in a couple of stages, they shared this dossier around with media outlets, then they took it to the FBI. And of course, keep in mind that we know of at least one senior Department of Justice official whose spouse was working for Fusion GPS. But once they share it with the FBI, they then leak further that the FBI is looking at the dossier. So Man. in effect, it's, it's a twofer from that standpoint. You shouldn't use the FBI as a component of your campaign. I think we can all agree. Peter Schweitzer, thank you for that. That was really interesting and really dark. So I, I'm grateful that you <laughs> Thanks, explained <Dr>. that. <laughs> Thanks. Well, Democrats have often suggested, and their allies in the press have amplified the claim, that the White House has somehow been taken over by Russian agents. So why did they just vote to extend the president's surveillance powers? Wouldn't that be helping Putin? We'll ask one of the Democrats who didn't do that next. We've had Congressman Adam Schiff and Eric Swalwell, both of California, on this show many times. Both of them are proponents of the Russian collusion narrative. They've demanded and have pushed along a massive year-long investigation into the collusion, which supposedly happened, because they say they fear the highest level of the American government was penetrated by a de facto Russian operative. Okay. Well, imagine how surprised we were then to see how both of them, Schiff and Swalwell, voted yesterday. Both of them voted to reauthorize the Foreign Intelligence Surveillance Act, FISA. That bill gives the executive branch sweeping powers to monitor even U.S. citizens. It's an astonishing power to reauthorize when the president himself, you believe, is a foreign agent. A cynical observer might even conclude that all this concern about collusion is just theater, not reflecting their actual beliefs, but we are happy to believe their fears are genuine. Yesterday's vote wasn't cynical. It was Schiff and Swalwell being just irresponsible. One Democrat who did not vote to continue mass government surveillance, good for her, was Congresswoman Tulsi Gabbard of Hawaii, and she joins us tonight. Congresswoman, why didn't you vote for this? Uh, for a few very simple reasons. Uh, Section 702 under this FISA Act basically allows the U.S. government to uh, tap into or surveil communications of foreign targets on foreign soil. Right. So this specific Section 702 is something that, as a veteran, I understand is important and is necessary as uh, we try to make sure that our country is not attacked by terrorists. However, there has been and continues to be a gaping loophole in this that allows for law enforcement officials basically to, to search and use the incidental communications of American citizens that are caught up in this collection uh, without a warrant. And that's really where the unconstitutional uh, issue comes in. Why myself, uh, I believe 40 other members of Congress, Republican and Democrat, introduced an amendment that fixed these loopholes, that allowed this program that uh, provides this, this provision that allows you to surveil foreign targets on foreign soil, making sure that we keep our country safe, but also striking that balance where we're protecting the constitutional rights of American citizens uh, so that they are not being, uh, their, their communications are not being searched or used by law enforcement, again, without a warrant. Right. I mean, that's a Bill of Rights it's, it's, right. I mean, that's a exactly, fundamental right. So exactly. what was the, two qu compound question, what, what's the argument against that? Why would anybody be against that? getting a warrant f for snooping. And second, why was there no big debate that the re filtered down to the rest of us over this? Uh, that's a good question about why there weren't more people talking about the seriousness of this issue and what is really at stake here. Uh, there was some debate that happened on the House floor, and it was interesting because you had Republican and Democratic leadership stepping up to protect the status quo, speaking out against our USA rights amendment. And there were a lot of uh, uh, m misinformation and, and uh, things that were being said that our amendment would do that, that they didn't actually do. They said, oh, well, this will make it so that our intelligence agencies can't go after terrorists, point blank saying things like that, that simply were not true. Uh, the, the crafters of the, the, the amendment were very careful to make sure that we allowed those provisions to continue that are necessary to prevent a terrorist attack. but protected the constitutional rights of Americans. So why would people be against this is, is really the, the bottom line question. The intelligence agencies came in time and time again saying this program, Section 702, is purely for foreign targets on foreign soil, not for Americans. So it raised the question that we never really got answers to, then why would you oppose our amendment <laughs> exactly. that limited and, and provide that check and balance? D due process probable cause, and a warrant. 
If you give up your constitutional rights, what's the point of any of this? And, and that's really the irony of the situation is that when you look at what terrorists want, they want Americans to, they want us to give up our rights. They want us to give up our freedoms. And by allowing this to continue without fixing this unconstitutional uh, loophole, then we're essentially ceding and the, and the terrorists win. I agree with that completely. Congresswoman, thank you. Thank you. For joining us. Aloha. Another Democratic lawmaker joins us after the break to explain why he protested the flag during the Pledge of Allegiance. Plus, Dave Portnoy of Barstool Sports on his big win over the greatest behemoth of them all, the NFL. Stay tuned. Well, it's not just NFL players. A member of the Missouri House of Representatives is taking a stand against the American flag as an act of protest, he says. Representative Bruce Franks raised his right hand with a clenched fist during the pledge on opening day of the 2018 legislative session. He said he prefers to, quote, pledge allegiance to the people. Representative Franks joins us tonight. Mr. Franks, thanks for coming on. Thank you for having me. So you've got a sweatshirt on that says, I'm rooting for everybody black. How would you feel if I had yeah, one on that said, I'm rooting for everybody white? What would your response be to that? Um, I wouldn't be upset about it because your shirt didn't say you're rooting against everybody black. Okay. Um, so you raised a fist uh, in, I guess, mm -hmm. defiance. Or t Tell us what this symbolic act meant. What did you mean by it during the Pledge of Allegiance? So I've never said um, the Pledge of Allegiance. And even in the House last year when I was in session, um, most of the time I wasn't in the chambers because I know mm -hmm. that there are a lot of people that, you know, have a lot of respect and, and, and feel proudly about the flag and the Pledge of Allegiance. Um, I know how I feel. And so my raise of my fist was basically power to the people, um, to all people, all power mm -hmm. to the people, invested into the people. Um, and when I say I pledge allegiance to the people, um, that's who I'm chosen to represent. Um, that's who I'm elected to represent, but even before I was elected, um, that's who I stand for. Well, I mean, good for you. I think you, you were re elected by the people, and you ought to represent them. When you say you know how you feel about the flag and the Pledge of Allegiance, how do you feel? So when I think about the Pledge of Allegiance, um, the thing that sticks out most is when I hear for liberty and justice for all. Uh, when I think liberty and justice for all, we obviously haven't seen that across the United States. Um, over time, over my 33 years of living, we see that there are, um, when it comes to justice, uh, that looks a little different depending on sometimes where you're from, depending on sometimes what your socioeconomic status is, um, and what you look like. Huh. So, I, okay, but w so does that mean you're against the Pledge of Allegiance because it holds those up as ideals? I, I'm, I'm confused. No, so I understand that they hold those up. Um, my thing is um, we talk about um, liberty and justice for all. We repeat a pledge. We pledge of allegiance. Um, and I pledge allegiance to the people. Um, that's who I stand for, and that's who I stand with. But what about the country? And aren't the people in the country kind of the same thing? Or I mean, it, you're beha I don't know how you feel, which is why I'm asking you, but it sounds like you're opposed to America when you take a stand against the flag and the Pledge of Allegiance, but maybe that's not your position. I'm, I'm opposed to folks in economically distressed communities being treated differently in America. Mm -hmm. I am opposed to um, the way um, our government um, treats our economically distressed communities, um, our marginalized people in America. We have plenty of veterans um, who support me, who support our right to protest, no matter what that is, even if um, they don't necessarily agree. Uh, many of them have expressed to me that this is the very reason why they fought. Um, they fought for our First Amendment rights. And we're not always going to agree on when we exercise them or what we're exercising them about. Right. But it, it's our right to exercise them. Yeah. Well, you, you'll, you won't find that contested here. And I, and I agree with you, actually, that poor people are treated badly of all races often. I want to ask you one last question. You made news recently when lyrics that you wrote as uh, as a mm -hmm. semi-professional rap artist before you got elected came out and they talked about killing snitches. And th mm -hmm. that, seemed, that seemed like something maybe you'd want to repudiate. You'd want to say, boy, I'm, I'm sorry I suggest it was a good idea to, quote, kill snitches. What's your position on that? 
So my position is, um, for one, uh, we often hear about my old lyrics, um, but they don't pay attention to the new lyrics. They don't pay attention to the new stances. Um, that was at a time when I was an artist. Um, I was using my art, I was using my similes and my metaphors as we do um, in rap. But um, I don't stand by those things that I said, um, as well as we're talking nine years ago. Um, and a great man said, uh, don't be so quick to condemn those who don't do as you do or say as you say as quick. There was a time when you don't do the same things, uh, do the same things that, that you do now. So All right. I would like for people to pay attention to the, the current situation and the fight that we are putting up and the stances that we are taking rather than um, old lyrics from nine, ten years ago. Mr. Franks, thanks for joining us. I appreciate it. No problem. Thank you. Last week, we had Dave Portnoy of Barstool Sports on this program to discuss how the NFL stole a slogan for a T-shirt that he came up with. At the time, the NFL was girding for a lawsuit from Barstool Sports, but they have thankfully backed down in the powerful face of Dave Portnoy, who joins us tonight to celebrate his victory against the megalith, uh, the NFL. How did you do this? How did you win? How did you beat the NFL? Nobody does that. Uh, you know, I don't really know. I, f I found out as of walking out of the office, I think, Thursday, that they submitted. I've used the analogy. Uh, we said, you know, either pick up a sword and fight or uh, roll over and let us pet your belly like a dog. And Goodell rolled over and we're petting his belly, his legs going. So I don't have, I don't have the recipe, but they rolled over. So it's great. So basically, they're afraid of the power that you wield as the head of Barstool Sports. I think they were afraid that they were just wrong. I mean, they stole the shirt. They said we didn't have a trademark. We did. So I don't think they expected to get called on it. We called on it, and they rolled over. Good for you. It's nice, it's, it's nice it to see good. justice prevail once in a while. So the NFL is in a pretty tough spot, lost a ton of viewers, um, and I think they're worried, it's fair to say. So you follow this for a living. Why do you think that is? What's the core problem in the NFL? Well, I think it's a combination thing. I, I, mostly, I think there's more competition. There's so many different ways to view different, whether it be sports, entertainment, channels, the Internet. Yeah. Um, so they got to fight for eyeballs, and they're not doing a great job with it. He's kind of lost touch. Goodell has, I think, with just the general people. So all the factors coming together, but uh, competition, number one. Places like us, places that you can just you know, consume content a million different ways, it's hard to keep attention spans. Do you think taking a position against the, the famed New England football franchise might have hurt the NFL in the end? I mean, when you mess with Tom Brady, do you think there are karmic consequences to that? Well, what do you think? Of course. I mean, anytime that yeah. you mess with a uh, basically a deity, you, you run the risk of running into the repercussions. That's what happened. Yeah. So you tried to warn I mean, the that's NFL. That's just a fact. Right. No, I mean, that's, that's exactly right. Do you think they regret not listening to you, because I think you raised this years ago when you said you guys are real. It's like Raiders of the Lost Ark. You're, you're pulling the tiki off the stone. You don't know what's going to happen. And they just totally blew you off and, and kept hassling him. Have they apologized for ignoring your, your wisdom? They haven't. To this, to this point, I think that Roger Goodell has still refused to admit that we exist, even though we've sued them, we've gone to jail uh, protesting them. We've done a lot of things. But I, to, last time I checked, he said he had never heard of us. So uh, he has not apologized formally, but we await that. <laughs> so I heard you got a bee sting today. It was a major beast thing, uh, Tucker. I was laying at the pool. I'm in Miami, uh, and I was just relaxing. And next thing I knew, I got stung by a bee. My finger blew up. Uh, but I'm here, and it's 9 o'clock on a Friday, and that just speaks to my work ethic. So almost like a mailman, it doesn't matter what nature throws at you. You bull forward. Yeah, and the mailman, I don't know that they continue through this. I mean, again, there's all sorts of, I'm not going to disparage mailmen. I know yeah. I'm here. I did my job to quote Bill Belichick.